Hello and welcome to this webinar on governance during challenging times. I'm delighted to welcome you to the Rebuilding Heritage Programme, which is funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund under the Business Support Programme. I'm Sarah Murray. I'm the Project Manager on the Heritage Alliance's Rebuilding Heritage Programme. A little bit of housekeeping for you before we start. Audience members, your cameras and microphones will be switched off throughout. We do have the chat switched on today, so please say hello, interact with your fellow attendees, and do let us know if you have any tech issues. We have live captioning switched on today, which you can turn on via your Zoom menu. And we will be recording today's session, and some of the content will be made available on our website afterwards. Rebuilding Heritage will provide training and support for the sector to help heritage professionals and heritage organisations respond to the challenges of COVID-19. We'll offer free resources like this webinar, which will be openly available, as well as one-to-one -one and group support, which you can access by application. Support on the programme will be delivered by our partners, Chartered Institute of Fundraising, Creative United, Media Trust and Claw Leadership. The next round of by application support will open on the 26th of November and details will be added to our website at www.rebuildingheritage.org.uk. The deadline for applications for this round of support, which will be going live in January and February, is the 16th of December. You can also now follow us on Twitter at heritage underscore RH and please do use the hashtag Rebuilding Heritage. Now onto the session itself, I'm delighted to introduce you to Hilary Carty from our leadership and governance partner on the programme, Claw Leadership. Thank you, Sarah, and good morning, everyone. We're delighted to be working in partnership with the Heritage Alliance and a range of partners to try to provide tangible support to organisations, networks and individuals working in the heritage sector at what is, certainly in my experience, the most challenging of times. And if you are a trustee right now, you will certainly have experienced extreme tension, high anxiety and perilous uncertainty in the past months. For governing our organisations, which is already quite a demanding task, has shifted to a whole new level. I know that we at Claw Leadership have worked through more versions of our business plan in the last six months than in the decade before that we are indeed governing during challenging times. So this webinar has been formulated out of the range of questions that you have asked to the Heritage Alliance so that we can be as responsive as possible to the issues at the top of your agenda. We'll kick off with Keith Arrowsmith, a CLAW Leadership Governance Associate, who will provide a broad review of governance in 2020, including information on roles, responsibilities, structures for effective working. We'll then have the opportunity to hear from Rianne King, Chief Executive of York Museums Trust, about her experience of navigating this crisis in real time and the ways she's worked effectively with her board to both manage the present and try to keep that essential forward outlook in sight. We will take some of your questions after each speaker and Keith will close the session with some top tips on how to achieve good governance. So please do use the Q&A function, you'll see that at the bottom of your screen and we'll keep an eye on those and work through as many of your questions as possible. So that's the setup for the next hour and we're going to try and pack in as much as possible. So I'm going to move swiftly on to introduce Keith Arrowsmith. Keith is a solicitor and senior partner at Counterculture LLP who advises on charity law and governance for a wide range of organisations and sectors. Keith, this is a fantastic time for your work. I can imagine that you're busier than ever. Yep, it's uh, busy times and uh, having to deal with lots of people and lots of organisations facing uncertainty. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I thought it'd be really helpful for us to just pause and think around how do we manage governance in 2020. And to help us get there, I've put together a few bullet points which we'll go through. And as Hilary said, lots of time to address any particular questions that you might have. I'd start to say that 
we ought to recognize that it's going to be easier to govern organizations when they're growing than when they're shrinking you know all of us want to be involved in those recruitment panels but none of us want to be involved in a, a redundancy selection process and that's because at the heart of governance is the people you know we are here because we are passionate about the work of our organizations and how we can interact to help make them the best we can i think in the old days we used to think well you know if we've got three months reserves sitting in the bank then that's absolutely fine and we can cope with anything that might be thrown at us i think what 2020 has told us is that actually we can have three months reserves to help manage a process of winding down or merger but actually we don't know when that three month process might need to begin and we might face an extended period of uncertainty change lockdown and therefore it's not just that last three months we need to be planning for it's it's this interim period that we're facing now so uh, let's just uh, start by saying okay what is this thing that Keith's talking about what is governance and in case you're worried there is no one definition of it it needs to be flexible because the types of organizations we work in are very different and although there are some things that are common and they're the kind of things we're going to be touching on today there are going to be some specific things about you your organization and the work that it does that means that you have to have a governance structure that is right for you so i'm looking the ways that you manage those processes the ways that you make and implement your strategic decisions it's the long-term view that we're interested in when we talk about governance and to help us get there my test and this does change year after year but at the moment my test for good governance is to answer this question how do we know that everything will be tickety-boo in three years time and I think if we have that kind of sense of not aiming for perfection and not aiming for what do we need to do tomorrow, then we're in a strategic frame of mind. How do we know that everything's going to be tickety-boo in three years time? What I'm not looking for are the organisations that are trying to sweep things under the carpet. And I think that's where there is the strategic risk, the governance risk. And we're pretending that everything's okay everything will be um, uh, kept continuing as normal so with that kind of emphasis on good governance how do i spot it well there's lots and lots of measures and we'll come on to some of those a little bit later on but here's a starter for 10. i'm looking for organizations that are compliant i think that we need to make sure at its heart we're working with organizations that are following the rules and regulations of the land and not getting into trouble with our regulators. And that might be the Charity Commission for a lot of us. We've got to make sure that we're working in an accountable fashion. That is, we know how we can report and explain and be responsible for the consequences of the decisions we're making today. The decisions we're making today will haunt us for, for a long, long time. So we've got to make sure that they're right and we've got to make sure that we're articulating them in a way that makes sense to the people that need to hear that story. We've got to be responsive. We've got to make sure that we are making decisions that are um, going to make the most of those limited resources that we have in a timely way. Sometimes it's about what do we need to do to keep the doors open this week, but we've also got to balance that with that strategic view of what's going to be happening in 2022-2023. I know, Hilary, lots and lots of organisations share your concern that that business planning process seems to be, you know, ha having a real tension at the moment about what will that future look like. And I think we have got to live with that uncertainty for a while yet. So compliant, accountable, responsive, it's got to be participatory. We've got to find a way of working that means that we're having communication with our communities. And maybe we've got to reassess who those communities may be made up of. Um, efficient, you know, the work that you do is so important at the best of times 
that we've got to make sure that it is supported properly and transparent. We've got to have a level where we are clear on what we are doing. Um, and with that, you'll see that as if by magic, uh, we are looking at something that has a um, carpet as an, as an acronym. Uh, there we go, it's as if we planned it. Um, and I would say, let's just keep that in mind as we go through the rest of the points going forward today. So um, very quickly, should we forget 2022? Of course, we shouldn't forget what's been happening. We, we have got to recognize that for lots and lots of people, this has been a time of loss. And whether that's a loss of people we know and love or people and places and activities that we hold dear to us, we have got to recognize that. And with that in mind, we need to allow a space for reflection, reconnection and renewal. But we've also got to make sure there is an impetus going forward. We have got to recognize this new normal and we have got to plan for what this looks like in future years. How do we get there? Well, the board needs to take its role seriously and it's part of this larger picture. So the board must determine the strategic direction for the organization, that long term view. And it's got to make sure that to get there, it acts prudently within the scope of its objects and constitution. And if we've got that as a building block, then all the legal stuff, the regulatory stuff, the best practice stuff can be built from those foundations. But it's not just about the board's role, it's about how an exec team, the volunteers who are involved in our organisation support the board. What do we do to make sure that the board can make those decisions at the right time? And it may be that we need to check in with the board. It may be that when they joined the board, these people had lots of time and energy to support the processes that we're talking about. And it might be now that they, they haven't got the same space, or it may be they've got much more time and energy than they had before. So why not use this time as part of a regular board review process so we can check in to make sure we've still got the right skills that we need going forward and we've got the right people with the right time and energy to bring it to fruition. We also need to look at the membership. Uh, who are we here to serve? And how do we help the organization's community to support the work of the organization? It, that's a really important connection between the people and the strategy. What's the point of putting a new strategy together if it's not going to reach the day-to-day -day activities of the communities we serve? Here's the one little bit of legal update you need. Um, it's really unusual, but we had a charity law case that went all the way up to the Supreme Court this year. And the court decided for the first time ever that charity members, the voting members, the people who are in charge at the annual general meetings, they must take the decisions for their charity that are in the best interests of the organization. And that's been a debate that's uh, been happening ever since Victorian times, whether voting members can vote in their own best interests rather than the charities they support. But I think it's the connection that's the important point for there. So let's just now look back at the year, some research that's taken place and find out what does good governance look like in this time of crisis. There's NCV have published this uh, guidance and we'll make sure you've got a link to that. And the Charity Commission have also published some in, uh, important rules and regulations to help us navigate these times. So here's the facts and figures. Most boards are meeting more often. So it looks like one of the big responses for now is that we need to meet more regularly. That seems to have been uh, one of the responses. And it looks like most of the agendas are focusing on risk, no surprise there. And the surprising thing might be that 6% of the charities surveyed hadn't even had one meeting to discuss this. It, they had chosen to step back and, and in effect wait. And it may be that was the right thing to do, but I doubt it. So uh, most people think there's a greater urgency in relation to those strategic decisions and a good percentage, over a quarter, voiced that uh, an uncertainty about the quality of the information they were getting 
to enable them to take the best possible decisions. So I think it's the organisations that are doing a, a, an appropriate level of measurement to get that information back to the trustees that are going to be um, the ones that are best placed to take those steps forward. And they're doing it in a clear way. There's a process that they are following, even if that process for now is shorter term. I think we need to have that focus on decisions because um, at this time, delay might cost. So focus on decisions and embrace the fact that we are using these new technologies and also just take a view on whether they are the best technology to use for a particular situation. You know, if, if there are a mix of ways of meeting and disseminating information and making decisions, let's make the best use of the mix rather than saying Zoom is the answer for everything. It's not. 39% of people feel that decisions didn't lead to real change. I think there's a frustration that we seem to be just keep revisiting the same kind of concerns time and time again. We have got to live with a way that enables us to change. We've got to embrace that change to help us with the current situations. And that's about having a system that you can rely on, um, timetables we know about, and everyone knows their role. I think there's been a temptation for trustees to roll their sleeves up and get involved in the delivery of the nitty gritty to get us through this crisis. And sometimes that's exactly what we need to do, but that's a short term answer, not a long term strategic view. We might need to encourage trustees to get back into their strategic role in order for this to proceed. Um, you've got to know what kind of risk appetite we're looking at. You know, it may be if we're looking at fundamental change, we need some mavericks in the system to help us identify and push through those changes. But if we are looking to change, now's a good time to, to, to make sure that we're aware of potential bias. What's the point of going back to the old ways that have caused so much pain for so many people if we can actually start addressing those, um, um, those elements of decision making processes now? And because things are happening in a hurry, keep that decision log. What we don't want to do is forget the decisions that we took at the beginning of lockdown um, and just keep revisiting and revisiting it. Yeah, we, will, we will lose the plot if we're there. Instead, we need to refocus on that strategy, make sure it comes through into the activity that we're planning and make sure that we're not just chasing things that uh, might not be appropriate. Yeah, there are lots of organisations using um, internet for, for the, you know, in different ways now, and that's fantastic, but, but does it distract us from our, our real passion, our real um, identity, our real connection with our community, or is it going to help us with that strategic direction going forward? I've said delay might not make decisions easier. You know, I, I, I am sure that the 6% of charities that haven't had a meeting this year will make um, decisions next year, but it's going to get harder. And we're not having that kind of sense of embedding change in the kind of thinking processes we've got at the moment. At its heart, it's all got to be about the vision. It's all got to be about that sense of mission that sits behind it. To help us get there, the Charity Commissioner said, we're allowed to have meetings using these new platforms, regardless of what your particular constitution might say, but it, it reminds us the importance of keeping records. If something goes wrong, those minutes of those Zoom meetings will be the thing that is the charity's record of what the trustees, the board decided. So keep those decisions, be careful about the chat function, the art, you know, things might be said alongside the main meeting, but is that part of the decision-making processes? Get the feedback, find out what's working and what's not working and keep, keep inventing a new way of making sure those processes are in place. You know, lots and lots of people are gonna be attending sessions like this, getting to know how the new technology works, finding out what the other organizations are doing in similar positions. Let's all find ways of spreading out this wonderful new way of working to the best possible selection of people going forward. 
if you want to measure it. The governance code helps us. It's not ideal, but it is published for smaller organisations and larger charities. And here's the list of the kind of uh, the principles that are embedded in the governance code. And the diversity principle is being reviewed as we speak. I think we've got to recognise that 2020 has been a year where people have started taking diversity seriously. So let's let's make sure that that's reflected in bo the board's role and the board's decision making processes. Let's stop doing things because that's the way we've always done them. Let's unlearn from that history and instead make sure that the new way forward embraces that change. Um, we had a wonderful session uh, with Claw um, when Nina Simon talked about this idea of unlearning from the past and I'd certainly commend her work to you. And one of the things that struck me was that focus on skills. We don't need to recruit people who are experienced. People can learn on the job, but they need skills and they need support to get there. And maybe one of the tools to get you there is one of the things that Hillary's helped develop, which is the Cultural Governance Alliance, which shares best practice. And we've published some really interesting, simple tools to help uh, actually get some of this stuff um, happening on a day-to-day -day basis. So Hilary, it's been a whistle stop tour, but that's the kind of things that I'm seeing in the sector at the moment and the kind of um, impact that we're feeling on behalf of our clients um, in their discussions with funders and supporters. Oh, that's terrific. Thank you so much, Keith. And thank you also for um, putting up the Cultural Governance Alliance. I would absolutely encourage everyone on the webinar today to sign up to the Cultural Governance Alliance because Claw Leadership, along with a range of partners, created this specifically to respond to the questions that you're having. So it's, um, it's, it's directly related to cultural and heritage sectors. So do, do sign up. Keith, that was a fantastic overview there. Um, and I'm going to be looking into the Q&A function for any questions that you've got. So please do ask them um, in the Q&A function. One of the ones that um, I wanted to pick up on was you mentioned reviewing the board at this time, that it was a good thing to do. And I wondered who should lead that? Who, sh who should lead that board review? Well, I, th I think um, there's two, two kind of models I'd like to suggest for now. And the first would just be making sure that there's a mechanism for board members to check in amongst themselves. Mm -hmm. you know, lots and lots of boards are just used to turning up to a meeting every now and again and lovely catching up with their friends and colleagues, but then they step back. And I think at this time, especially when we are relying on these kinds of technologies, you know, actually people are gonna be feeling that responsibility in a little, you know, a different sort of way. So just making sure that all of the board have got the contact information for everyone else and they have that kind of chance just to check in and say, how are you? Are you feeling comfortable with how things are going? And just hearing about the kind of stresses and strains on a kind of informal basis is brilliant. Mm -hmm. And that can be started through, through the chair. I think the more strategic review, which is, okay, we might need a different set of skills uh, for the board in order for us to enable the strategic vision to be uh, to, to be produced and, and then monitored going forward needs to be something that's much more focused in the everyday. What's the point of having a strategy if it doesn't actually impact on the activity? So that needs to be led by a combination, I think, of chair and chief exec or, or, or senior director. And I think it's that relationship between chair and senior management especially the, the, the chief exec role, that's going to be key going forward. You know, if, right. if that's not right, if that's not strong, then I think the rest of that review and structure process is going to be really hard to manage. Great, great. Thank you. So again, about that leadership really working together, working together around the mission. We've got a couple of questions in the um, Q&A function that are essentially about that Supreme Court decision that you mentioned, um, acting in the best interests. And one of the questions, thank you, Claire Grist Taylor, um, says, how would you recommend handling any mismatch in those best interests? 
um, in how those are defined, understood or accepted, even though the vision strategy and the business plan have been shared. I mean, it's that interpretation of best interest, isn't it? We've got a similar um, request from Peter Martindale. Thank you. Lovely. Well, um, just, just to fill everyone in. So this is a case that's been rumbling through the courts for a long time. It's about a, chil a children's charity, a foundation that was set up, and it was set up as a bit of a messy marriage breakdown between some incredibly wealthy uh, uh, people. And as part of the marriage breakup, there, there was an arrangement whereby an existing foundation was making a donation to a new one. So it, there's all sorts of things sitting behind it, but it really brought into focus this idea of the importance of that relationship with the membership. And there's been one or two instances we've seen in the press over the years um, I think that the famous one is the, the National Trust and they started getting a sense of people were joining the National Trust not because they're passionate in, 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 in the work of the National Trust but because they had a view on fox hunting and that, that that kind of tension started to build up between the people who were the members and what they wanted and what the National Trust Board wanted and we're seeing a little bit again now where people are kind of saying, hang on a minute, we the members don't want you to do this work. We want you to do something different. And so it is really important to have that sense of connection with the community. And when they are the voting community, then the board is at their mercy. If the voting members don't like what the board strategy might be, the voting members can decide to have a new board with a new strategy. So that the link is really key and how do we make sure that's right well i think that comes back to engagement i think that's 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 the trick here it's making sure that we have that kind of participatory relationship with members rather than just looking at them as some you know, just as a source of funding or just as um you know, a, a, a pain because we have to arrange an annual general meeting and buy the custard creams you know it's 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 got to be more than that mm -hmm. so yes i think i think we end up you know sweeping under the carpet if we haven't got that participatory element to this kind of creating a modern version of the strategy for for, for the future Great. Thank you very much. I mean, really emphasising there the need for dialogue and connection and keeping that communication live with, with all the board and also the membership. Thank you. We're going to hear more from Keith later on, but right now it's my pleasure to introduce Rayanne King, a British curator and museum director who's chief executive at York Museums Trust. A Claw Fellow, Rayanne has completed 10 years at Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery, National Museums Liverpool and Heritage Lottery Fund, amongst other roles. Rayanne, welcome. Thank you. Sorry for the slight delay there, finding my unmute. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here and what a fantastic talk from Keith. Um, I should say a little bit about York Museums Trust when, well, as I start. So we have three museums, Yorkshire Museum, York Art Gallery and York Castle Museum. And we also run botanic gardens that are visited by about one and a half million people a year. Um, gosh, this COVID thing, what a roller coaster. I don't know about you, but I felt like it's just wave after wave of um, new stuff, things we don't, haven't encountered before, things we have to react to, the latest government decision on a Friday that we need to implement on the Monday or the Tuesday. It's just felt like a very reactive time. And we have maintained the governance structure through that time. So we uh, were really tempted, if I'm honest, in the early days to kind of postpone board meetings or whatever, but actually we thought, no, actually what we need is a, we, we had an emergency board meeting soon after the crisis because we knew our trustees would want to know what's going on. And then we've stuck with our usual um, regular meetings and occasionally uh, additional ones as well to, at moments of important update. Um, we've also greatly increased the frequency of the audit committee um, and they have really helped us reviewing lots and lots of financial forecasting and scenario planning and it was pretty critical because we had COVID not happened we were looking at um, in sort of June July we would have been looking at doing our statutory accounts for the previous year 
as things stood in June and July, our auditors were saying, can't sign you off as a going concern. You're closed, your income's gone. Um, so our audit committee was absolutely vital in managing that relationship with the external auditors and helping us to uh, sort of navigate the waters to get to a point where actually our external auditors were able to sign us off. And I'll say a bit more about that in a, in a bit. Um, and the other board, uh, function that we increased was we increased the frequency of our meetings of our separate trading board uh, because we need money right now and also if anything they were even more exposed than us as a charity. Uh, so just to give you some examples of the key decisions that the board had to deal with, um, firstly when lockdown happened really it seems to me that there's been two types of reactions, two scenarios that people have gone with. Some organisations like some theatres, like our local theatre, decided pretty much to furlough everybody they possibly could in order to make as much advantage as possible of the coronavirus job retention scheme and get as much income in on the back of that scheme. Or people reduced to a core team and that was what we decided to do because we felt it was important to maintain our relationships with our public, to actually increase our fundraising efforts, to think about how we would shift our public offer online and, um, and keep all of our scenario planning particularly going and we needed some key people to keep doing that particularly in finance. But I wanted our board to be comfortable with whichever decision of those two critical decisions we decided to go with. So that was the reason for kind of the first emergency meeting, if you like. And then when we got to reopening, we decided that we wanted to experiment. Uh, we were facing such an enormous drop in income that we thought it would be um, a waste of an opportunity really, don't, don't waste a good crisis, if we didn't try and do something different. So we looked and thought about the two things that we've um, wanted to experiment with but had never dared to because of the potential impact on our income of that experiment. So we thought, well, the income's shot anyway, so <laughs> let's, let's try and do, learn something here. So the two things that we did was we've opened the art gallery on a completely different business model, and we opened the castle museum in a completely different way. So normally when you go to the castle museum, you buy a ticket and you wander around. Now you have to choose from one of four or five tours and you just stick with your tour group and you have an hour and a half of tour. Um, and that was partly because that was the only way we could operate proper social distancing in the building, but it was also something we'd wanted to experiment with for ages. We wanted to try out tours and see what the market was for tours. So, but again, I felt it was really important that the board were comfortable with these two quite radical changes and were comfortable also with the fact that these were experiments and therefore risky, would have an impact in lots of ways. Um, so we involved the board in, in that critical decision. Um, and then the other thing was deciding how far to meet the requests of funders and stakeholders. So um, in order to get Arts Council emergency funding, we needed to agree to transfer all of our designated reserves into our free reserves. So money that we had set aside to spend on new Roman galleries, on other projects, all had to be emptied out of that pot and put into our free reserves and they've effectively kept us going thus far. But that's a really big financial decision and it's a big strategic decision because it means now Right now, we don't know how we will fund some of these key projects that we had planned for the future. So obviously, the board needed to be absolutely um, critical and you know, really the decision was theirs about do we do, we do that? Um, and actually, in some ways, we didn't have a lot of choice, but it was important that the organisation understood the implications of what we were having to do. Um, and throughout the crisis, there have been various decisions like that that we've had to make around things like the percentages of normal pay, around our redundancy process that we've had to go through. And in that case, the thing that has really come into its own has been the remuneration committee, which in normal times meets once a year when we're doing our annual pay package, but which we've actually relied on for quite a few key decisions um, through this process. So my lessons learned. Um, firstly, I really um, liked what um, Keith was saying about the importance of the vision. 
we had just finished doing a big exercise developing our vision together with our staff our volunteers our members um, prior to lockdown having that vision helped us get through the crisis and coming out the other side now and that has been really really critical so having that strong vision in place really helped and similarly clarity about priorities really helped at the beginning I basically said right that's it we've got five priorities but for now we have one which is surviving Covid that's the top priority and I think that clarity really helped us all collectively focus our Covid strategy and I think it helped the board as well to agree that clarity early on so that going forward we knew where the focus of a much smaller team was um, because we were um, obviously furloughing large numbers of staff. So I think another lesson learned would be keep those meetings in the diary. I felt that actually maintaining the governance process provided the one key point of calm and stability when everything else is changing around. Having to write those board papers in the normal way, all of those things actually really, really um, helped us take stock, see where we were in an ever-changing situation. Um, another note would be just about who really is responsible for governance. So obviously those key decisions I've talked about are our board, but we have some critical stakeholders as well. So we have the City of York Council who give us a regular grant and have done ever since we were founded in 2002 as an independent trust. And actually the huge amount of relationship building that I've done with councillors and officers in York City Council came into its own um, because they have ended up being the organisation that have underwritten us for two years. So that it's worth remembering, I think, when thinking about governance, that actually these other players um, that sometimes seem like you're reporting to out of duty actually can really come into their own if the relationship is strong. Um, and finally, just thinking about looking beyond, looking beyond the immediacy of the crisis. I think my takeaway for, in this context is a really interesting shift to local, local agendas. You know, York's a tourism city, we get lots of visitors, but actually through COVID, we were really thinking about our local audiences. How do we support our local community? How do we play a civic role? How do we be a good citizen? And I think that question goes, goes forward. And I think there's a, that raises questions about types of governance that can involve local people. Um, and it's interesting because they're mainly interested in things like our programme and our activities. So how do we empower our local communities um, in what we do to be true to our vision? And for us, I think that's our next governance step, just thinking about not just participation, but how do we really move more of our decisions that people are involved in and invested in beyond just being democratic with staff or doing the odd takeover with community groups how do we actually empower our community partners more in real decision making around things like programming collections and our overall future thank you Gosh, perfectly uh, timed as as expected. Thank you very much, Raoul. Uh, just it must have been an absolutely horrendous experience to watch a key source of your income just absolutely put the shutters down. I mean, as chief executive, if, if I can ask, what did you do to really keep the show on the roads in that time in terms of your governance with the staff and the board etc what, what what did you do as chief executive because that's quite a pivotal role yes i think um in terms of keeping the show on the road the challenge was right at the beginning when it became apparent that we would be locked down and then we went into lockdown and then there was a kind of brief period when lockdown had been announced, but the furlough scheme hadn't. And there was massive uncertainty. And so in that scenario, it was really important for me as CEO to be visible, to go to the sites, because we had staff still coming in to close sites, because at that point they didn't know what else to do. Um, and I had to be, and also there was a the lesson there about being honest. I ended up doing an all staff message um, on video, but also in person where I could. Um, saying actually we are hoping that there will be some kind of support we don't know when that's going to be announced bear with us 
hold with us while we wait because what we don't want to do is make a rushed wrong decision. And really, I suppose we've taken that kind of approach all the way through, trying to pe pe keep people as up to date uh, in the decisions as we can, but also being honest when sometimes we're waiting to find out what's going to happen about something. Um, and I think that clarity of um, message around the vision was also really important um, and being really clear about what we are trying to do as an organisation now is different to what it was before. Um, and, and we've noticed when we realise that we've been being pretty consistent about that message to everyone who's been working through this period, uh, because, of course, when people came back from furlough, uh, there was then you know, a huge difference between the people who've been through a culture of constant change over the last few months and people who've not been through that. So the other task as a CEO has been supporting managers and leaders to integrate our teams back together, to bring all these different experiences that people have had in COVID and uh, sort of bring them back together, sharing that, accepting actually, as I think um, Keith, Keith, you said, accepting there's a time of loss and a time of mourning and taking some time with the teams to allow that and to recognise that as well has been quite important as we're trying to now step forward again. Thank you. A, a really, really tough gig, as they say. Um, you mentioned in your talk, if I can just say, um, if you've got any questions for Rayanne, please put them in the uh, Q&A. Um, function and we'll pick them up. But um, one of the things that you mentioned was about encouraging the board to experiment um, and to try all new things that, you know, the, 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 the crisis gave you a bit of an opportunity. How easy was that to get the board to experiment? Um, well, you know, as is often the way, I started with my chair um, and knowing that if I could get him to be behind it, then that would help with the argument. Um, and I mean, it's, you know, this is where boards are so useful, I think, is that um, James asked, you know, probing questions about why, how would we evaluate it? How would we know it had been a success? and really pushed us to make sure that by the time we actually presented it to board for a decision, we'd sort of run it past a few people. Um, but actually by the time we were saying, can we do this? We were accompanying that proposal with an equally long really proposal about how we were going to evaluate the experiment to make sure that the experiment was actually meaningful. Mm. Um, and so I think once we had that, then I think, I think people were interested in that approach. Um, and I think they were, they felt, well, we are making the best of something by, by doing it this way, rather than just opening in the, in the normal way. Yeah. And are those experiments things that you will keep? I mean, one of the great things about being able to trial things, certainly we found that at Claw Leadership, we've experimented, we've trialed things that we've not done before, um, you know, things like this webinar, putting some of our courses online. And some of the learning from that has actually been terrific and fantastic, and we're going to keep going forward. So it's an opportunity to learn new blended ways of working. Will that be the same for you at the museum? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, some of the, the things that everybody's been learning around using Zoom and, or Teams in our case um, has been really important. And it's interesting because although we all of our sites are in one small city and you can easily walk between them, we found that we've got much better site working now when people are actually talking on teams rather than making that walk between venues. So I think there's been something there and our teams have said to us that they would like to continue with those Zoom chats uh, because it makes sure that they're in more frequent contact across the different sites. And that has been, they found that very creative. It's enabled the different creative teams at different sites to sort of, you know, create more uh, exciting product. Um, so that's definitely going to stay. Um, in terms of the kind of big experiments about different business model at the art gallery, we're still looking at that. But I think what that has given us is even if we don't stick with the experimental model, we'll have much better evidence about our audiences, about how they reacted to that model. And if we were to want to do the model that we're doing right now, which is free entry, but we're paying for exhibitions, I know now exactly pretty much how much that's going to cost. And I've got a much better set of facts and figures to go and make the case to the city council, for example, if the city council wanted to support that to carry on then I can be much clearer 
with them. So that's given us lots of really useful information that we'll hold. Yeah. And I think at the Castle Museum, definitely, the tours have been a huge success. People love them. So the challenge now for us is to figure out how to open and get volume through, but also have the additional tours as well on top of that when we reopen. So yeah, lots to take forward. Thank you. Uh, round the, uh, a wicked question. <laughs> I mean, one of the challenges is about trying to plan forward and trying to look at, you know, when we anticipate that things will be open. It's not even about going back, but what might the new normal be? What kind of horizon? I mean, how do you cope with trying to plan forward with so much uncertainty? What kind of horizons are you looking at? Just something sort of tangible to help us from that perspective. Yeah, so we haven't actually been doing keys three years. We've been doing kind of two years. Um, and then we started on the third year. I would say we started thinking about that about three months ago. But we didn't start there. Um, so what we've tried to do throughout is kind of, is we've been very heavily reliant on looking at our financial scenarios. So we've had our finance team running, you know, where we think the scenario is um, and a worst case and an even worse case. Um, has been the kind of scenarios that we've worked on and our um, our kind of mid case is the one that sort of ended up being closest to to the reality and um, it really helps in terms of thinking about what our proposals were for emergency funding and then having a plan um, but we're now right now actually revisiting all of those financial scenarios and we're going to be doing it again I mean what we what we got slightly wrong was we we actually predicted lockdown ending later than it actually ended so we did have a bit of a scramble to reopen for the 1st of august which was a date that the city council really wanted us to open because york went for a kind of dinner moment we're open 1st of august the yorkshire day um so that was interesting to to do and that was quite short term longer term um it's been very much about running the models and we've used things like the association of leading visitor attractions did lots and lots of audience surveys about um future trends and that's been really useful and i think that's what i'd say you know the mantra for a while was very much um monitor scan and adapt you know so it's just constant monitoring and adapting to see what people are doing where people believe they themselves will be in two to three years time and then making assumptions about audience behavior on the back of that and then trying to run the figures to see what that tells you um, so that's been pretty much our our approach um, whilst always sticking to the vision so right now we're starting our five-year business plan mm -hmm. and we're starting very much with outcomes and putting things together in the way that we would normally put together a business plan. It's, uh, and our vision really helps us with that. Um, but what we will be doing as part of that is refining. Um, and again, we'll be using lots of sensitivity analysis, I think, because the world is, is changeable. And I think the other thing that's been a big leadership challenge is getting teams to understand that actually i think there's not just this one big change. I think we've got to accept that the world is probably going to be quite unpredictable for quite a while and we need to figure out a way that we can be more comfortable with that yeah great thank you keith if i could bring you in here because that last point that Rianne mentioned about being comfortable with uncertainty i mean when you are trying to look at a three-year vision and to be you know forward looking but strategic and tactical and responsive how does the board keep all of that together what 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 are you seeing in your work with organizations about how they're balancing those different horizons we start with the concept of a board being prudent and i think for lots of people they thought prudent means risk adverse keeping things tight you know, carry on carrying on not not going for the, the things that need huge amounts of risky change but i think what people are coming to is an idea that actually being prudent has that concept of change built into it you know, you're having this kind of idea that we need to have a plan that um, we can we can realize in many different ways and then it's you have to balance out which of those ways is the most appropriate one 
uh, in order for us to achieve the strategy and that longer term vision. But I think as long as um, all of those routes are seen to be heading towards that vision, we're okay. Um, I start to see tension where it seemed to be a kind of competition where, where you, you, you either have one vision or you have another vision. And that's where I think the resources start getting spread so thin that there's a real issue then on whether, whether that's a prudent route to go forward. So it's, it's that balancing act of finding a way of articulating a vision that has choice. Interesting, isn't it? I mean, the word prudent doesn't immediately for me kind of sum up that change, but it, it absolutely has to have that opening. And um, one of the questions, so, sorry. Sorry, Hilary, the, the other aspect is that relationship with the funders, isn't it? And I think, Ray, you're right, you're right, you know, it's how do we find a way of keeping that connection with some really important stakeholders, and in your case, York, York, York City, in a way that um, is helpful doesn't lock you into a particular way of working that's going to be inappropriate in six months time and has that flexibility built into that relationship too so it's 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 having flexibility within the team the board and that conversation with the external stakeholders yeah good 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 thank you there was one practical question are you using any different platforms for monitoring and transparency keeping things going between the chair chief executive are you uh, have you shifted have you adopted any new ones is there anything you might recommend uh well we shifted to teams uh which we um weren't using before um and so that's been very good um, in terms of, you know, uh, kind of things like risk register and so on, no, I'm afraid we haven't um, yet. I mean, I think, you know, we've, we've moved quite a long way in terms of making digital much more integral to what we, how we work, but we haven't moved as far as we need to move. And I know that there's all kinds of platforms that we sh should be using, but aren't yet. Um, so for us, the big challenge was particularly around introducing online donations and online ticketing. It's embarrassing that we didn't have online donations before. And actually, you know, one of the things that I think um, for us, the crisis has meant, it's just meant accelerating things that we knew we ought to have been doing anyway. We'd already decided to do them. We just had to do them a lot faster than we'd originally planned. Great. Okay. We, one final question in this section we've got, how can external um, stakeholders who advise boards on operational governance and funding engage boards who don't always talk to them often enough in normal circumstances? So when you haven't got, Rayanne, you talked about the, you know, a good relationship with the city. What, what happens if you, if, if you haven't got that? So was that question from for in terms of the organization getting the board to have the relationships with the stakeholders or i think it's it was coming from the like the city council um you know how can you without seeming to impose i imagine yeah yeah um i, I think just keep asking is what i'd be tempted to say um but perhaps it's about asking the right questions in the right way mm. so i think what's really um what, what really cements my relationship with the city uh, or our I should say relationship with the city is that we have designated people who have particular relationships with particular people in the city so I had a finance and strategy that handles the relationship with the chief officer and I handle the relationship with the cabinet member and we both make sure that we have regular quite informal catch-ups and that is a much more useful way of developing the relationship than the six monthly formal um, reporting to the scrutiny committee which we also do and take seriously but that isn't what builds the good relationship it is ultimately it's like having a good relationship with anyone else um, it's you know you just have to put the time in I'm afraid absolutely thank you okay right we're moving towards the end of the the seminar now if you do have any other questions please put them in the Q&A section but I'm going to hand back to Keith who's going to share some top tips with us well it's been fascinating to hear how things are ha happening with you and Rianne in, in, in York and I think there's something about the timing of what you've been able to do that's really impressive you know, making sure that all of those conversations 
happen with the right people at the right time as well mm. is you know when there are so many pressures on, yeah. on an organization is it's just lovely to hear and uh, um, if I was wearing my hat I'd be doffing it to you um, <laughs> what what can others take from that well that's um what I was trying to do is find another way of kind of articulating this idea of um, the, the board's work and how that fits in with that kind of strategic vision stuff and for those of us who don't like bullet points and lots and lots of words I thought let's let's get one of my um, illustrator friends to kind of come with a kind of concept that's a bit more visual um, and I think what's come here and it's been reiterated today is this idea that we've got to have a certain vision and we've got to have a way of articulating it but that means you know finding that space and making sure it's a safe space to explore it properly and I've, I'm showing that as a clearing in the woods, but this kind of idea that we as a board have a role in making sure that we're patrolling, we're having one eye on the activities of the organisation and making sure they're happening in a prudent way, but we're also having an eye on what's happening in the outside world and that connection with stakeholders, that connection with membership, that connection with the audience and the visitors, and what's changed in the meantime. And if you're sitting in the middle of the wood thinking that nothing has happened, we're going to end up you know, missing some of the bigger things that will affect us, You know, the, the forest fires that might be happening just out of sight. Um, and if we start um, uh, losing that, that vision, then we're going to get into trouble. And what I've been seeing over the last year is that some boards have, have taken their eye off the ball and it's because they've got distractors and it might be because they got really interested in actually being the people who have been leading the tours. That's the thing that got them out of bed and, and really passionate with this new way of working. And actually, if they're too busy doing the tours, they're not they're not having enough time to, to look at that more strategic level. So you know, that's something to, to guard against. Others have got so entrenched in the way that they've worked to date that they've kind of dug themselves into a bit of a hole. And then it's really hard for them to get back out of that and get a sense of movement, a sense of change going forward. And, and others have just completely lost the plot and gone off a little frolics in, in, into the woods. And that's where the monsters live. We've got to be a bit careful about these frolics and that's what yeah that's the danger that's the risk so having that kind of sense of what it is all about and how we're going to work together to achieve it seems to be key so with, with that kind of just in the back of our mind how do we do it in practice so we've talked a lot about identifying that core vision the purpose of the organization and making sure that the way that's articulated in your constitution is the first thing to check. I'm, I'm looking at lots and lots of organisations that have found fantastic new ways of operating, but the danger is they've strayed too far away from their core purpose that's set out in their constitution. You know, if, if you are, um, uh, you, if you've been set up to look after a particular heritage asset and you're looking to expand your reach, that's fine, but make sure it's within your core purpose. You've got to look at your resources. What's the point of uh, heading off in a new vision, a new strategy if you haven't got resources? And some of that's going to be money, but also it's about those those people skills that you touched on, Ryan. You know, you've won wonderful. You've got those subgroups that are providing that extra level of support, but you need that resource to help with management of that change. And you need to know what's happening in the outside world, mapping the external factors, making sure you've got a sense check back from those major stakeholders that they're going to support you with the funding, making those um, experimental changes. Um, you've got to make, uh, I think, that sense of what will this mean in the long term? What is that strategic development that, that will underpin it and not pushing anything under the carpet? So start small. I like that idea of, of trying one or two experiments out to see, see what happens. You know, it, it's fine if you've got the scope and the time, but let's make sure if they're not going to work, then you know, put them to bed early rather than sort of saying this is going to be a three year, four year uh, provision when we're not sure if it's going to work or not. Keep it small. And also you get that sense of building in change to the strategic 
vision as well. You know, we, we can cope with things coming and going, and that's absolutely fine if we've got a way of reporting that through. And you've got that sense of consultation between the team with the stakeholders and visitors, then we've got a sense of it having a way of it being measured. Um, having said this is all a big crisis, let's, let's not, we don't have to rush. We can do things at the proper pace. There's very few things that have to happen by five o'clock today. Um, so give it time to mull over these important aspects. Don't, don't, don't think that everything has to happen straight away. And it may be that actually we do need some changes at board level. You know, if we're looking at some of these experiments that are radical, then we need some radicals. And that's absolutely fine too. You know, the kinds of skills and experiences that people bring to the board table are really important. But it might be that we've moved on over the last 12 months and the kinds of skills that we need for the next 12 months, the next 24 months, might be a little bit different. Having had that kind of strategic thing, we've then got to root it in the day to day. We've got to have a way of making sure these decisions count. You know, what's the point if we're not going to move things on? So how do we do it? Well, we've touched on it, that, that relationship between chief exec and chair is going to be key to all of this. And, but maybe for some organisations, it's time to revisit perhaps another role, the vice chair, you know, that kind of deputy role, because there is so much happening now and there are things that are changing so fast. Let's not heap all of the responsibility for all of it on, on that one relationship. And if we are trying to embed new ways of checking in with each other, then having a second deputy on the board might be really helpful. And if nothing else, on Zoom calls, it means that one of you is talking, one of you can listen and do that checking in to make sure that every board voice is heard during the really important debate. So if, if nothing else, think about appointing a Zoom vice, um, but maybe as an experiment, then finding uh, benefits from that on a slightly broader basis. Um, focus on the objective, make sure we know why we're doing these experiments and, and, and make sure it's kind of fun to have this change process. You know, some people hate change and that's absolutely fine and we rely on that stability uh, at some times, but at others, you know, actually it could be fun. You know, we, we need to find reasons why people want to volunteer and help with their time and energy at this time. And if it's all doom and gloom, you know, it's going to be hard to keep that momentum up going forward. So let's find some things to celebrate. Let's find some things to enjoy together, even if it's sharing, you know, an hour on Zoom um, with three gin and tonics. Um, but we'll find a way forward, you know, and it doesn't, it, 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 it will come, um, but we need to work at it. So, and that's where that kind of testing and evaluating bit of it, I think, comes in. And maybe let's let's throw out one idea for today you know maybe we ought to pledge to make sure that our board is younger at the end of this process you know in general the views of young people aren't heard on boards like ours that we work with and if we are thinking about the kind of community the kind of space that we want to inhabit in the next few years maybe it's it's the younger generations that have got something to be said for that and there's some really interesting polling data that's come out of america that um about that kind of interaction between young people and the communities they they live in young people in the world they want to live in young people in the kind of organizations that are, they're engaging with and all of that is you know i think fascinating let's learn from that um, what to finish with? Well, the work that you do and the organisations you support are, are fundamentally important to so many people's lives that we can't afford to get this wrong. And I think when time and energy are so in short supply, we need to make sure we're doing it right. Um, and and when, I, when I get involved as a solicitor, it's often when things have, haven't gone right. And almost always with the benefit of hindsight, I can say, oh, you, know, you missed that opportunity, you missed that chance. And I know, you know, with so much happening, you know, mistakes will happen. That's absolutely fine. 
but that failure to have a strategic view, that failure to have that connection with the community are the things that really make me grumpy. Hashtag grumpy Keith. Hillary always makes me smile though. Thank you, Keith. Keith, hashtag grumpy Keith. Let's try it and, uh, and avoid it. So <laughs> thank you so much. We've got um, just over 10 minutes left. And if you have any questions at all for both um, Keith and Rian, then please let us um, know your questions if you'd put them in the Q&A function um, so that we can pick up on the really rich uh, information that you've both shared with us. Thank you so much indeed. Keith, I'd love to, to come back to you. You mentioned um, keeping momentum and trying to instill that sense of fun you know and the, the passion with which which is why we all join these boards in the first place it can be really quite tough to do that what do you do to get the balance right because it's not really a fun time how how do you do that but so i think the first thing i reflected on was what happens when i normally go to a board meeting you know, in a in a meeting room remember those um and of course the first thing that i do is have a chat with the other people who are in the room while we're getting our cup of coffee and custard cream we're checking on each other and what's been happening in everyone's day and and what's what's important for their life at that particular moment and hearing about all those wonderful things that they've seen and visited and those exhibitions that they they've got inspired by and i think the danger is with this kind of technology is that we all sit there quietly till the time when the meeting's supposed to start because we haven't got us that kind of we can't have those little one one to one little chats and then we dive straight into the serious stuff so if, if nothing else let's find these little moments to have these little conversation to happen as well as the, the important stuff that needs to happen in a board meeting and if, if that fails then i just stick my comedy hat on <laughs> Yeah, I've got I've got a selection of my Yorkshire caps. You know, let's let, let you know we, we we will find a way of making sure that someone smiles at the end of it. But that but the the serious thing is let's celebrate the successes. You know, there are going to be organisations that don't survive this, yeah. and I think the danger is because that's the stuff that we're going to get reported week on week in 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 the press. You know, the kind of things that the Art Fund have been saying this week about the research that they're showing about that kind of attitude with with galleries and museums uh, for the next year you know it's, it's important stuff to read but knowing that tours are happening in York is, is, is a lovely thing to know and I'm so glad that I know it and I might not be able to get there for a few weeks because I'm not allowed out of the town but knowing it's happening and that there's a way to make sure that I can visit again in the not too distant future it's, it's, it's really, you know, lovely to hear, you know, I, I really do feel that. And I think we have to find those moments where we can share those successes and those, those, those moments of, you know, lights at the ends of tunnels that, uh, you know, re really do make the difference to people. Mm. It's, it's, it's fascinating. You've just, I've just had the thought, oh, perhaps we should open the Zoom room 10 minutes early or something so that, you know, you can just have that space equivalent to grabbing a coffee and, you know, kind of just getting people to, to talk and share without the kind of, right, okay, 10 o'clock meeting start. Lovely idea. Really lovely idea. I wonder if I could ask both of you, what is the, the one new innovation that you think actually it might have been tough but we have benefited from this switch this new way of working is, is there one or, or just something that you think actually that hasn't it was tough at the time but it was good I, I know an example for us we did our first webinar Keith you'll remember you you joined me on this madness we set up a webinar in four days I mean, you know, for, for someone who's sort of planned and, you know, we sort of need to make sure we've got all the right speakers and all of those sort of things. But um, that first webinar, it had to be done within the next week. Otherwise, the timing would have gone. The issue would have gone. People would have moved on. And I remember thinking, Christ, I don't know that I've ever moved so fast in this kind of setup. 
but we did it and it was a cracking webinar as well thank you Keith because you helped make that happen and I really took the learning from that about okay I wouldn't have chosen it and I still wouldn't choose it now but it was great learnings. That's one of the things for me. I wonder if I could come to both of you to just share something that you'll, you'll take forward. Yeah, I, if, I, if I come in, um, just, just on that um, thing about uh, celebrating and, and checking in though, I, I'll just share that our senior team, we check in every single day mm. at 9.15 and it's just, how are you? And you know, I did the I cleared up the garden leaves yesterday, or whatever it is, and it's very short. But actually, I think it's been good because, as you say, Keith, there is a real temptation otherwise to just everything to be really sort of artificially focused yeah. all the time, and it makes it very exhausting, doesn't it? Nice. Um, but yeah, the thing I think for us was our curator battle. Um, you know, yeah. that was that came out of those brainstorming sessions cross site that I was talking about, which will definitely keep going. Um, but also, you know, just the power of social media, you know, we reached one and a half million people with that, with that social media fun thing. And we engaged with the Hermitage Museum, you know, uh, the Met, all these, to be honest, really big players compared to us, but also really tiny museums who had not even been on Twitter before Curator Battle, but decided they wanted to be part of it. And so they joined and had a set up a Twitter account. So I think for me, the big learning there was, you know, about really letting talented young staff just go for something, you know, because I think when it was proposed, we were like, uh, yeah, okay. You know, I, I for one didn't understand how it was going to go, you know, become so viral. And I think that for me, that's about social media, the power of fun, and, um, you know, and just letting the talent we've all got amazing talent in our in our organizations you know letting it be free uh, especially at, at risky times when you can just try something out you know i think it was great and all down to great staff oh uh, your curator battle was lovely it just tickled me pink to, to to see it and we're getting some positive comments in the chat as well on that one keith oh for, for me i think it's been to look at how we work with um, people who we haven't been able to talk to before. And it might be because actually now might be the time for people who, you know, it's the introverts like me who, you know, have a struggle, you know, um, having going to big events and doing big things. And actually, you know, these, this kind of technology and little, little groups and little tours may be a way into a brand new way of making sure that we're reaching some of those parts of some communities that we haven't spoken to before and I think you know that other people get energy from those different sorts of ways of talking so to have the opportunity to have a breadth of options available to us for the future is, is a lovely thing to have you know those new resources are seen as something that can complement work rather than replace it it's been fantastic and being able to talk to younger members of my community has been absolutely a, a joy um, and sometimes yeah that's where the technology helps because often when I'm talking to people they know me as the grumpy lawyer you know trying to help sort, sort some stuff, stuff out but actually if someone's sending me a gif of a cat falling over that's fine too. Oh, that's fantastic. I have to say, you know, similarly, one of the things that has been great is, you know, just being able to put on these webinars and to be able to reach really significant numbers and to have fantastic panelists like yourself join us in sharing some of the issues, the tips, your experience. Thank you both so much. It's been fantastic to hear from you this morning. And I know that um, the, the information that you've shared is really, really valued. Thank you very much indeed. I think, you know, three points from me as, as, as I sort of wrap up. I think um, both of you talked about keeping the vision, keeping that vision in sight so that we remember purpose and it inspires and stimulates us into action. And I loved the phrase about, you know, being prudent actually now has to include allowing room for change allowing room for change and that is as much about um being prudent and rayon you talked about the experimenting 
and using the opportunity to experiment and not just to kind of hunker down. You've got to be able to kind of look up and look out even whilst we're in such a difficult time. Can I say thank you very much to both of you. It's been a hugely enjoyable morning. Um, thank you to everyone who's attended. I hope you found it helpful. And if you are interested in learning more from the Rebuilding Heritage Programme, please do join us for other sessions in the future. Sarah, I think you're going to close us out. Yeah, just to say again, from me as well, thank you to Hilary, Keith and Rayanne. That was absolutely brilliant and really interesting points for people to take away. We hope that everybody found today's session useful. Um, please do look out for the feedback form that pops up after the session. It will also be emailed to you after the event. We would really appreciate if you could take the time to complete this because it will help us to plan future training and support on the programme. And finally, again, that website is www.rebuildingheritage.org.uk. Thank you all so much for attending and have a lovely afternoon.